well, you're right, but I don't like being tricked like that. And I was like, what's you a trick? You tricked. It's like, your job to read. Mm-hmm. And moments like that make me so happy. Like, <laughs> like slapping someone on the side of their face with the purchase contract verbiage is the high that I chase in real estate. Yeah. Because I love these negotiating stuff the last few years. Welcome to Selling Your Circle. I'm your host, Juliana Gainsburg. And on this show, we talk all things business development, entrepreneurship, and investing. Each week, we'll have a different guest because after all, it's about expanding the circle and keeping it fed. If you like what you hear, follow us on all of your favorite streaming platforms. (laughs) Okay. Welcome back to Selling Your Circle podcast. I'm your host, Juliana Gainsburg. And today, I have... One of my very good friends that I met through real estate, and I know I've said that before on other episodes, but legitimately. You're saying that to everybody? No, I've said that about Connor Tuck, who is a very good friend of mine I met through YP. Mind you, one of the founders of KW Young Professionals over here. The one and only Kelly Henderson. (laughs) (laughs) The crowd goes wild. Wow. Yes. Any hoozy (laughs) wussies. How are you? I'm good. I'm powered by amoxicillin today, so we'll see what comes out of this mouth. The, sin- the sinus infections are just killer. Makes me have a, oh, I think of Phoebe from Friends when she has her sexy phlegm. So I hope <laughs> that's the vibe people get when they hear this, that I've got a really sexy voice. That reminds me of that one time that we stood around at a KW event and we talked about the thumb thing. Yes. That was from Friends, right? Yes. So since you guys weren't there, there's an episode of Friends where Joey, I think it's Joey or someone, maybe it's Phoebe, Phoebe finds a thumb in her soda. And I was making this joke about it. And everyone's like, Kelly, that did not happen in Friends. And I was like, it did happen in Friends. And it was this whole argument. And I was right. Yeah, none of us um, were big Friends fans. I was too young for that. I'm just going to be honest. I did watch Friends, but I was probably shouldn't have been watching Friends when I was watching it. Like, I remember being on a family vacation in Florida to visit one of my dad's friends, and they had Friends on, and my mom was like, oh my God, like, she loves Friends. And my dad's friend's wife was like, she's like really young to be watching Friends. My mom was like, it's great offended. Show. <laughs> my mom was like, what? She watches Sopranos. It's a great show. <laughs> Like, it's, it can't be worse than that. <laughs> um, no, that just, like, triggered that for me, though. So, um, yeah, I haven't said that about everybody that's been on the podcast. However, it just oh. so happens that a lot of the people I have, majority of them, have been through KW Young Professionals. I'm not surprised to hear that because I think like what you're trying to accomplish with this podcast lines up with a lot of the missions of other like groups of people we're in, involved with. So like that makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, I think it all kind of stemmed from that. Right. So when I got into the business, the way that I could provide value back to my peers was that I was the youngest in the office and I was the most savvy with social media. So I never took social media courses or marketing or anything like that in school. It was just kind of something that I was familiar with and figured I could utilize for business. And then that turned into helping other agents, which turned into teaching classes, which then when KW Young Professionals was an option to have a chapter in our, in my area, I was asked to be on for socials. And then that turned into teaching national and then so forth and so forth. And then from that, I built agent to agent referral relationships and that really is the root of selling your circle, right? So yeah, the circle part is really great for uh, my real estate business for sending and receiving referrals. However, there's been connections like you or my friend Darnell who, or my friend Kate who have given me opportunities to either do other things like outside of Keller Williams, like buy my own real estate and find, um, like property managers or meet people in like the music industry and go to cool concerts or just like other connections that I've cultivated through this real estate themed group, but it's not necessarily real estate activities. I've never felt much older than you until everything you've said the last Are like, you five kidding minutes. me? 
You're talking about technology. Dustin, my husband, got a new phone like a week ago and us transferring the information from one to another. And like, I'm the one who ended up solving the problem. And I told him, like, I can't be the tech savvy one in this relationship because I'm terrible at tech. And then you were like, oh, yeah, I was just like the young tech person. So I just did that. It was just like. (sighs) And now I go to these like music shows, music people. And I'm like tired hearing Okay, well, for starters, I don't want to hear you being tired because, quite frankly, when we're together at these conferences, you are the one that wants to keep going and be out getting it. Okay, so I'm not going to say anything more than that, but. Let me loose. (laughs) You are the one that's like, yeah, yeah, we'll say for 20 more minutes or whatever. That's fair. I'm like, you just let me know when it's time to wrap it up. That's fair. I think there's been like a couple of times where I'm like, you look at me and I'm like, and you're like, okay, we okay. can leave now. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I just, I, the company had so many people, like my office where I started had so many people that always had their hand out, like, what do you want to learn? What do you want to do? How can we help you? And so I wanted to find a way to like contribute and provide value in the same sense. So that was just something that I latched onto. I also was raised in a world of like phones all the time. I know. So it kind of worked out in my favor. Sometimes it doesn't, but. I believe that it worked out. You do amazing things. Thank you. You're welcome. But that that culture of launching, like that um, organization is like the main reason why I think I would ever, like if I ever thought about holding my real estate license at another company, that would be the main thing that holds me back. I can appreciate that. I think YP. a lot of the communities that we're, that we have exposure to are unique. Um, and it makes me happy to hear you say all those things because that was the vision when we started KWYP was to be able to create an environment like that for our younger professionals. Yeah. So when you started that, did you, it was a group of you, right? Yeah, there was five of us. Um, and my friend Alex out of Texas, mm-hmm. he was the one who kind of had spearheaded it and he was really well connected at KW. Um, and it made it easy to get a lot of eyeballs on it. And then it just kind of expanded from there. We each had our different roles and, and created a goal planning for it and this whole vision. And the idea was eventually that KW would take it over. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Which was cool. It's, we have like almost every, I think it's like almost every state. I'm not like surprised to hear that. Getting close to it. When I first got into it, we had just under, or just around a thousand members. I'm actually not sure where we're at. I think we're Me close to two thousand. Sure. I want to say no. I mean, my chapter alone, when we launched, we were the first regional, and so we were up to over a hundred and twenty members at one point. That's awesome. I mean, it shifts because people leave the company, and it's not necessarily like leaving. Yeah. YP or people age out. It's under forty, so. We don't card, but you can't stay forever. One of us will be leaving that before the other one. Guess who is who? Not me. It. I could be a YP for like 20 years in total. I know. Look at this That's face. like doesn't even make sense, though. But that's because I got into the business when I was 19 or 20. 20. Well, then that just made me feel even older because by the time, you're right, by the time I age out of YP, it will have been almost 20 years in YP. But isn't that weird? Like you yeah. could be a young professional for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's like I already lo- don't feel like a young professional That's anymore, a long sure. time to be. I think most people, like, if you do, um, like, NAR, I think, has National Association of Realtors is, like, under 35. But most young professional groups are under 30 or under 35. Like, not. I feel like other ones that I've heard about or talked to outside of Keller World is not up to 40. The, the YP groups in, in Arizona are under 40. Under 40. Mm-hmm. People are surprised when I say that. Like, they're like, oh, I can't be in that. And I'm like, you're 36. You have four more years to be in it. Phoenix Business Journal does a 40 under 42. I feel like a lot of the groups I'm a part of, like 40 is where apparently things shift or change. Or yeah. I, don't know. I mean, that makes sense, though, right? The average age of a real estate agent is 56. So, like, I mean, really up until then, you're still on the tail half of that yeah you're still young and hip (laughs) so hip (laughs) speaking of um arizona do you want to talk about where you currently sell real estate 
Yeah, so I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona, Phoenix area. So really, the greater Phoenix metro is like an hour radius from the heart of it. So we sell all over the place um, out there. And I'm a native, which is funny. I don't know how it is here in Philly, but in Arizona, it's so transient. No one is from Arizona. Um, And so it's very unique to have someone who's actually born and raised there, but was born in Phoenix, went down to the University of Arizona for college, which is where I met my husband. Um, We came back up to Phoenix when we graduated and have been there ever since. Cuties. It's actually really, yes, he is very cute. Um, But it's really weird because, I don't know, you see those movies about like people who still live in their hometown or whatever. Yeah. And I never had a vision for staying, but I never thought I would leave either. Like, it just never was a thing. And where we bought our first home was like two miles from where I grew up, like my whole life. Yeah. Like, I went to the same grocery store and bank and all the. It's just weird how tight it's ended up yeah. becoming. Well, and I maybe I missed this, but did you say you went to college? The University of Arizona. So that's in Tucson, like two yeah. hours south of Phoenix. Um, so it's the furthest away I went. Yeah. Crazy. But you travel all the time. We do travel all the time. So I think that probably also helps that dynamic. Yeah. It's also, Dustin's from San Diego, so we get to go, like, it's nice to have kind of like a second home that's not Phoenix that yeah. we get to go to. Yeah. So for, besides selling residential real estate, you also previously were a coach with Keller Williams. Mm-hmm. And now you do coaching on your own. I do. It's um, very different than how I used to coach. What I loved about coaching within an organization is the like the big picture structure to it It was awesome. But then it got to this point where that didn't work with my life anymore. I've got a six and a four year old and working, you know, selling real estate full time and then coaching full time just wasn't in the cards. So I restructured it. Maybe in 2001, I left coaching for about a year entirely, like I didn't intend on coaching. And then then, um, I taught at um, Nashville at a YP event that we were at on wealth building, which is the topic I'm passionate about. And the like constant question I got was like, great, how can we get more of this? And I was like, I don't know, how can you get more of this? And that's when I built this coaching structure specifically geared towards wealth building. Yeah. And is that like something where you're like choosingly taking on clients or you're just openly like, if you want to be coached, let me know. No, I'm super strict about how I take on who I take on, actually, because it's there's two components to it that if someone's like disconnected from it, it's just not fun for me. And I really want to enjoy it. For sure. Um, and so I think one portion of it has to be this like will and drive for a very large net worth. And the second component that's just something that's specific to me is it's really helpful when they're in real estate because they make the kind of money that allows them to be in the position to grow big things very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into wealth building um, is through coaching, I started to realize that all of these agents made ungodly amounts of money, right? Like I had one client, her bank account balance cash in her checking account, $300,000. And I think of like a teacher makes that in like six years. Like what the hell are you doing with $300,000 in your bank account? And doing nothing, 0.01 yeah, or whatever, nothing. not even if it's in a checking. And, and the, or like I'm working with coaching clients who have, um, uh, weird debt, like debt in weird places that you're like, you have the money to not need debt. So like, what's the bigger issue here? Overspending or um, being purposeful with the money. And that's really what it comes down to. I think in any business, right, we talk about lifestyle creep, right? If you make $30,000 now and next year you make $80,000, the odds are your bank account didn't grow by that $50,000 chasm. It likely stayed the same because people have lifestyle creep and real estate is not immune to it. And so we see these changes in their income, but nothing changes in their life. And so that's really what I like to hone in on are people who make a lot of money and they're just not doing anything purposeful with yeah. it. I think I can relate from the coaching aspect. Like I don't really market that I do social media coaching much anymore. I did for a little while. Um, I've, I have three clients at the moment and I just, those clients will actually show up and listen and want to do the things that they're paying to be coached on and trust that what I'm telling them is going to lead to success. And so when you have people that are like, 
they hear about the coaching and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I want to do that. But then they're not really like purposeful with it. It's like almost, I rather them not waste their money and my time, you know, like I, 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 it's just like certain people I'll like connect with and I'll be like, okay, this would be a great fit or certain people I'll connect with. And I'm like, honestly, you should probably just send your admin. I just think there's a lot of people who see coaching as like a box to check. Yeah. Like, oh, I should be in coaching because all of the top producers are fill in the blank with whatever their judgment is are in coaching. So like I should do that too. I haven't had a coach. So one on one phone calls for about two years now. And it's because what coaching is for is a gap between where you're at and where you want to be. Now, you actually have to want to be there, right? Not just say you want to be there, but right when you're in a place and you want to be at a place, then that's what coaching is geared towards. And I remember with my coach, (coughs) with my coach a couple years ago, I remember finally getting on the phone with him and being like, I don't think we should have these calls anymore because I was finding myself trying to like come up with material for the calls because like I felt like I was supposed to be in coaching but the fact of the matter is I was doing exactly what I wanted to do and I didn't have anything that I needed to change now that won't last forever I'm not cocky enough to think that like I've got it figured out and like I'm good but with what I want to do right now I am good different Um, phases different seasons mm -hmm. of your business and so like when someone says like oh I want to be in coaching like well do you really want to be in coaching and that's the difference someone wants to be there then like that's the right person to have around you yeah I haven't really had a coach consistently in a while and I probably should (laughs) no like I probably should (laughs) but it's not like a I just don't when I need it I will get it it's hard to find the right coach like I know oftentimes people go into coaching through a coaching company or something um and they get matched with someone there's a reason behind it I think a lot of people are like oh it's just like pick out of the hat it's not not usually when it's a larger company but what it comes down to at the end of the day is with any coach it's just about setting expectations Right. We talk about that so often when we hire people or when we recruit people into our world. It's just about expectations and reality. And I remember my my sec, no, my first coach, Karen Brown, whom I love today. Um, Karen and I had been coaching for about a year and we got on the phone one day and I was like, I don't think this is the right fit anymore. She's like, well, what would it look like if it was? And I explained everything I wanted. And she was like, OK, could we press the reset button today and do that? And I was like, OK, let's press the reset button. Holy, she was like a demon human on the next call, which is exactly what I needed and what I said I wanted. Um, And she like flipped that switch instantly. And and they're trained to Mm -hmm. like be like that, be able to do that. Yeah. And I just think so often, though, like we're scared of hurting people's feelings that we don't actually tell them what we want. And then we resent that relationship until eventually we quit. That's not the right way to do it. (laughs) No, but that does make sense. Yeah, I the last coach that I had through a coaching company, I despised. I really hated her. I can appreciate that. The one thing that she did teach me or that resonated with me that I still use today is that in sales, if you're not in real estate, this works for anything, but your pipeline should always be moving. So if they're not ready, willing, and able to do X, Y, Z, whether it's selling real estate or selling a product or signing a contract or doing a service that they should be moved into a different category. So every day you should have new coming in, people going out, people going under contract, people being removed because they're just dead. Um, not dead physically, but like <laughs> dead as in like the lead. They might be dead. They might be just dead. Just keep an eye open. <laughs> people have died. Um, <laughs> but I mean, I mean just like dead in the sense of like me, for my example is that they bought a house with someone else. They're dead lead to me now. You know, they're not they're dead to me too. They're dead. <laughs> um, but no, she always said your pipeline always has to be moving. And that's like one thing that I was like, okay, yeah, she's right about that. Everything else is BS in my opinion. I have yes, a question. No. <laughs> <laughs> what do you guys consider the difference between a mentor and a coach? Do you want to answer this? I love it. Um, to me, a mentor, it, to me, a coach is someone you have a very established relationship with, whether it's the quantity of time you're meeting, the quality of what that looks like, the structure of what you want to accomplish together, whatever the case is. To me, a mentor is there less formally. It doesn't mean less effectively, just less formally. So when I think about my relationship with people, I have a lot of mentors, no formal coaches right now. So 
if I want to invest in something, I'm going to sit down with my friend, Brian. Okay, Brian, like, here's what I'm looking at. What do you think about these numbers? I haven't analyzed something like this before. And then he'll walk me through that. And then that's probably the end of that conversation for then. But then I might get together with him a couple months later to talk about whatever the case is. Um, to me, that would be the difference. The structure. Yeah. I think I have, a, I have a handful of mentors and have had a handful of mentors throughout my career thus far. Um, but that's the same way. Like you're paying someone to be a coach at an established time. There's a commitment, like your direct, it's like a coach is like a business therapist, essentially. That's the way I look at it. Um, a mentor does something the way that they know and believe is the true way to do it. And you are almost shadowing them on that sense. Um, and they'll provide guidance or you can call them if you have a question or you know something's going on, you wanna talk it through or they just provide value in the sense of, hey, this is how I'm doing it. This is where I found success. And you can also watch how I do it. It may not be the correct way. But I like this your is answer way better. By the way, way that I do it. I like that answer way oh, thank better. thank you. Yeah. 100%, right? A coach is supposed to work you to where you need to be eventually. Yeah. A mentor is more likely to work you to where they did things. Yeah. Well, that's like why when people, not to like bring up KW the whole time, but in KW world, they try to stop having the mentorships and just have the coaching programs for new agents so that agents could learn how to do things their own way based on the right, the right way, like, legally how to do the contracts, how to talk to people, how to structure their businesses. They wanted it, people to grow in their own ways instead of having a mentor where maybe you did ha split like a 25% or 20 or 10 or whatever it was, you did a split with them for a period of time, but you would be learning the way that they do their business, which isn't wrong. It's just the way that they are. So you don't really have that time to figure out what you like or yeah. the way that you think is the best way to do it, which is another reason why the company pushes to be a solo agent and go through coaching and get your feet wet before deciding to join a team because then you learn how to operate the way that the team learns the team operates which again could be fantastic could be the great decision might be the best decision for you and based off your personality and who you are and what you need um but I always when agents new agents come to me and ask me questions like I'm thinking about joining a team and I just got licensed and this and this like what do you think I always say if you have like the financial support to be able to give it your best go on your own you should do it on your own first and then decide if like you need the team structure or I, leverage. I get that. I have a different perspective on it, though. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Usually when I'm talking to somebody, so we can really take this outside of real estate and into business in general, right? If you're going to own a business versus operate in a business, um, I always think that it comes down to what are your passion? What are your passions? What are you passionate about? And how does that fit with either of those two things? So if we use real estate as our example here, um, I always say if you're the kind of person who wants to like... It's got to be my way, my thing, my own opportunity. The solo route's a great one, but it comes with plenty of downsides. And the biggest one, especially when you're starting out, is the world's your oyster. Right? When we're starting a business, we can do anything. And in real estate, they will remind you that every day that you should be doing X. Oh, you should have a social media page. Oh, you should be doing open houses. You should be doing cold calling. You should be doing this. You should be doing that. And then you get to this point where you're like, okay, well, I should be doing all of it then. And then for me, years later, I looked up and was like, great, all of this works, but independently, but none of it works together. And you have to get really narrow. And I think that's the downside to starting out on your own yeah. is it takes a long time to like learn through that. Now, I still 100 percent agree that starting out solo is the right opportunity for lots of people. I started solo and it ended up being the right fit for me. I then grew my team from there and I've subsequently shrunk the team. Um, but like I needed to learn it that way. But I think there's a lot of people who in that environment, they'll opt out because it'll become so overwhelming or so many options that they're never able to like narrow enough to be successful. And that's really where a team comes in handy, right? Where you can do the things you're naturally gifted at. Let's use uh, my mom's actually a great example. My mom works on my real estate team. She's my showing specialist and she slaughters that game. She's so friendly. She's so kind. She's so loving. She loves taking time with people. I hate Every part of that. Every part. I don't want to walk into a house with you. I don't want to talk about where you'll put your Christmas tree. I don't want to plan out like parties in your backyard. Like, look at the house. Do you like it? No, let's go. 
<laughs> I'm much more like mechanical like that. So my mom was an agent back in the 80s. Actually, sidebar, um, she brought me a box of like old stuff recently, a couple years back, and I opened it up and in it was a card from her brokerage from her baby shower when she was pregnant with me. And on the inside, it said, to Arizona's newest real estate agent. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that crazy? What a full circle moment. She also had in that same box were some flyers that she made back in the 80s for open houses that were handwritten. Oh, goodness. And she had drawn this cat, this, like, cartoon on (laughs) cat. And it had a little talking bubble that said, be cool, live on cool street. And that was the name of the address she was hosting the open house at. Like, this was some She's the cutest stuff. thing. She is cute. So She's what she will tell you if she was sitting here today is, like, she was terrible as a standalone agent. It's too much for her. Um, like, prospecting, not really her jam. Like, there's a lot of things that, like, is just not in her wheelhouse. But she kills it as a showing specialist. Yeah. And frankly, she makes more than most real estate agents I know. Yeah. Um, and so, like, I think, but the hard part is, right, she had to try that to find that. This episode is brought to you by Castle Public Adjusters. If you have fallen victim to property damage, Castle Public Adjusters is your first and only call. They will make sure that you get the maximum compensation for your property loss. Remember, avoid the hassle, just call Castle. 215-752-1237. And so I agree with what you said, and I have a little bit of a different perspective because I also think that there's some upside to slowing down enough to be like, maybe I do need to go this route to figure out fill in the blank. That is a good perspective because I think I always forget how good I had it with the coaching program that I had in my office. Yeah, that's a big thing. Like, I sometimes forget each office is independently owned and operated. Hmm. And you work for the compliance department? (laughs) Basically. Um... And not every productivity coaching program in all of the offices are the same. No, they're absolutely so, not. you know, I'll have agents come to me from other states and they'll be like, they want me to join this thing. I don't know if like, you know, they say it's auto enrollment or like whatever it is, you know, for their productivity coaching. And I'm always like, yes, like I'm like the poster child of that, like went through the whole program, did it on my own, got it. Like did all the course, extra courses around it, went to the conventions. Like I did everything that they're like, do, you know? Um, however, my coach, Heather Ayala is probably watching this. She's a gem. Um, who is now the broker of record of that office is just like a phenomenal human being and just treated all of us like her kids. And so I had that like team esque backing without being on a team. hundred percent. Uh, yes, who you're around in that environment. Yeah. Like I think the things the you're saying break. are like things that I had the opportunity to have being in that program. And it's just not like that everywhere. No. I mean, most companies don't provide the same level of education. Um, but I just, I had someone to be accountable with for generating business. I had someone who taught me how to do open houses, someone who helps me order signs. I had someone who brought in vendors like home inspectors and lenders for us to meet and build relationships with that would provide value in um, physically or, you know, monetarily in advertising and marketing. And we had people teach us on social media stuff or on, you know, scripts or ways to talk to people or how to do open lock boxes, like, you know, from A to Z. So, um, the structure that and like the support you get on a team was probably very comparable to what I had. So maybe it's, you know, that's a good perspective that not everybody would have that as a solo agent. Well, the flip side, though, is also that if you just go the team route, so you have that structure right out of the gate, you're also starting over if you go back to being a solo agent. You're starting over with education. So like the way I would explain it is, you know, if you've had a Subway franchise and then eventually you leave the Subway franchise and you want to start your own sandwich shop, well, do you really understand the intricacies of sandwich shop management? Absolutely. But you are starting over from a branding perspective, marketing perspective, and in real estate, you're typically starting over with your database. Yeah. You have maybe whatever your original components of that database looked like, but everyone you've met since you joined that team is not your... It, you're it's not, not your intellectual property. Yeah. Um, and so th- it's important to slow down before making that decision because it's going to have recourse no matter which direction you go. It's so interesting. Like, you know, people, <coughs> you know, people take contacts with them when they go. And it's like, what are you going to do? Like that, if that person has a relationship with them and that person wants to work with the agent that left, like, 
can't, you're not going to tell them no. No, and most contracts are also written that the consumer gets a say in it. Yeah. Right? And so, like, at the end of the day, it's going to complicate whatever it is. Most agreements I've seen written out talk about marketing. And that theoretically, if they can prove that you were marketing to like that person, them. that's the issue. Um, but if you have a consumer that comes to you and says, like, no, I want to work with you. I don't want to work with them. Yeah. Like, it's not like they got a say yeah. in this whole thing anyway. Like, I have, I was on a team for a very short period of time. Um, just I was in a place where it financially made sense to have my bills on the back end rather than the front end. Um, and I thought that it would provide support and education in a time where I wasn't in coaching anymore and I was solo. Um, so for a few months I was on a team and I was given a lead on that team. It was a past client of the team luxury. They had sold in, um, a suburb around here and moved to another state. And now they were coming back. And at the time, my rainmaker, like person who ran my team did not run buyers. Absolutely. hundred percent buyers were put to any agents that were on the team. And I, I guess he felt I would be the best fit for this client. So their budget was 1.1 million, which is crazy. Actually, I think it was higher than that. That's how much the house that they bought was. Um, and so it was my first buyer above a million. And I still talk to these clients. I just talked to her the other day. Like they're like family to me now. Um, and I imagine that at some point they are going to call me, whether it's to buy a beach house or um, maybe if they, I, I don't imagine them selling the home that they're in right now, but if they were ever to do that at some point, um, I imagine that they would call me and I don't feel obligated to do anything. However, because of my relationship with the person that ran that team, I probably will send them a referral. Yeah, makes sense. Maybe it won't be like a full 25% referral, <laughs> but I'm still going to send them something. I get it. Makes sense. Like I'm not marketing to them, you know, like I genuinely, she calls me probably like once every couple of weeks or texts me and we talk about like what worldly ifs? things. Yeah. I don't know. Or she'll be like, I went to the store and I got this shirt. They're like my second. She's like, I don't really consider her to be my grandparents age, her husband. I don't know. They're like additional. They're like a great aunt and uncle to me. And I just will go to their house with like lunch and we just sit out back and have a nice little lunch date. Cute. Yeah, they're great. Um, but no, I, I definitely think I would probably send him some money. It's always complications. But when... people don't do that. Like people don't think that way. I'm like, yeah, whatever. It's mine now. So but that's much. So much to unpack. Don't when people transition. It's tough. Yeah. But I'm just saying like I know... Like I've had, um, one thing I've thought about doing too, like I've had people refer me business and then those people, clients refer me business. Like, do you pay on that? I wouldn't, no. No, I wouldn't, but I have sent stuff. Yeah, usually, or I don't know. Um, and it's so interesting knowing like how broad your audience is on this because so many other industries don't have referral fees. Like it's yeah. not set up like that. But I always think like, when someone sends you a referral, what about subsequent referrals? Like, that they mm -hmm. themselves do. It's always so interesting how different people manage it. Yeah. Like, I had one from a KW. So, off, funny enough, most of my KW young professionals referrals don't come from the, the agent in KWIP. They come from somebody else in their office. So, like, mm, yeah. example, like, say I'm just an agent in an office, I'm not a part of KWIP. And I'm like, hey, I put my hand up, I have a referral for Arizona. And then another KWIP agent says, oh, I know this girl, Kelly. Mm -hmm. That's like majority of my referrals. Like somebody in a market center, whether they're YP age or not, will be like, hey, so-and-so gave me your number. They said that you're an agent in Philadelphia well, or whatever it is. Statistically, it makes sense, right? Because young professionals theoretically would have smaller databases because yeah. they haven't had enough time to grow it. Now we yeah. use the example of us being 20 years into the business by the time we leave young professionals, but that's also <laughs> not average. Yeah. Um, and so it makes sense that these agents who've maybe been in the business for 20 years, but they're 60, have a, an established database and would likely have more out-of-state referrals and stuff like that. Like yeah. I can see how statistically that makes sense to me. I just think it's... One, amazing that people speak up and say my name in rooms. 
And two, of that they do. it ends up not being from the actual agent in the division. It's from somebody else. But someone in Cleveland gave my name to someone else and he sent me a deal. And then during that, and Monica Reynolds would be very proud of me for asking for referrals during the deal, um, sent me someone else. So I was like, technically I shouldn't send him a referral fee on that, but I'm going to send him something. Yeah, a little nifty gifty. Yeah. A little Starbies gift card. Something. Something fun. But I'm very, I think that is how I was raised. Yeah. Like you just take care of people Mm -hmm. kind of thing. Which sidebar to that, a thing that I, something I thought about while you were talking about your mom and the full circle moment of your Arizona's newest real estate agent. Um, And I think I've said this on the podcast before, but my dad gave me this little book when I was little and I had to be like, I don't know how old I was, but it was in the age where you don't say like full sentences. Mm-hmm. And it said like- So like 10 or 11. It was like how to negotiate or <laughs> the art of negotiating or like, it was something like that. I, we haven't been able to find the book, but I had this thing where I always had something small with me. Like I always had like a little toy or something. I always took something small everywhere I went. And so I would walk around the house with this and my dad would be like, say like negotiate. And I would say it. That's so And funny. I would like walk around saying that with this book and then full circle. Now you do a little bit of that. Now I negotiate technically for a living. I love that. I also lately have been summing it up like, Real estate is, selling real estate (coughs) is managing expectations, getting people what they want before they know they want it. That's been like my saying lately. Like that's actually what I do for a living is just set expectations. 100%. And I think mostly I say that because we have been in a market where we haven't really been able to negotiate. It's kind of just like from the buy side, you put your best foot forward and hopefully you get picked. Yeah, That's but don't shortchange yourself on that because when you think about it, that is negotiating. It's your what you're negotiating with is the expectations your client has. Oh yeah, because you're still you're still 100 percent negotiating. It's just negotiating them to a point where they can align their expectations with their will to purchase the house. Yeah. Otherwise, then you're just writing, and we've done plenty of that, like some half-assed offers yeah. where you write it knowing they are not going to win, 100%. but that's where they're at in that moment. And sometimes it takes a couple losses you to, have to like coach them there. Yeah, sometimes yeah. it takes some losses to recalibrate expectations. You need to go through some pain sometimes. I liked the negotiating the last few years. I thought it was fun. Well, I will say now in the Philadelphia market, I'm in a different place. Now it's like we can do inspections and we can kind of negotiate back and forth as agents, which is great. I love that. Um, but a year ago, it wasn't. It was like best and finals are due by Sunday at 9 p.m. or, you know, whatever it was. And you just kind of like, go through the process with your client like how can we strategically make this as strong as possible without unloading the bank and that's kind of fun though in a sense because I have learned a lot of skills with that like using an escalation clause where that's a whole other episode to unwrap like what that actually See, that's what I loved about it was coming I remember I came to my broker and was like So this paragraph right here, and I found one, and it's about our appraisal contingency. Mm And so for not real estate people, if the house isn't worth what you're offering um, and you're getting financing, then you have the opportunity to cancel and walk away. And I said, what if I deleted that section from the contract? And she's like, oh, so like waiving the appraisal, there's a there's a different paragraph for it. And I was like, no, not that. What if we just deleted that section and, and I said, and what I would do then is do our appraisal in the inspection period. And if it comes in low, we would be able to cancel because the inspection period says it's the time to investigate, blah, blah, blah. And one of the line items listed in there, ironically, is value. And she goes, yeah, I, I mean, you could do that. Um, and anyone I talked to about this is like, well, wouldn't you have preferred just to shorten the inspection period? Like sellers wanted no inspection periods. And I was like, did they want no inspection periods or do they want no appraisals? Because the harder issue at the time in escalating prices yeah. is dealing with the appraisal. We got so many offers accepted from what the seller incorrectly thought because our agent wasn't educating them enough was 
waiving the appraisal. We weren't waiving the appraisal. We were waiving a time period separate. So we just did them at the same time. And I'll never forget, we had one appraisal come in low that we did this on. And I called the agent. And I was like, hey, here's where we're at. We'll need to reduce the price if we're going to move forward. And she goes, no, you deleted that section. And I had to explain to her, like, no, we deleted the timeline. And she got, like, really mad at me and was like, I need to call you back. I have to talk to my broker. Calls me back and is like, well, you're right, but I don't like being tricked like that. And I was like, was you a weren't trick. tricked. It's it your job to read. Mm-hmm. And moments like that make me so happy. Like, <laughs> like slapping someone on the side of their face with the purchase contract verbiage is the high that I chase in real estate. Yeah. So I love these negotiating stuff the last few years. I like when someone asks me to explain things because I've been in so many situations where people will like look me up or like they think because I don't know I sound young on the phone I don't know sound and young look young they are well, young well on the phone they don't know what I look like so they have to just I don't know I think people are looking me up but I was gonna say, not so much anymore it's been a long time since I dealt with anything like that but when I first was in the business I was very keen on learning all the things so it was a time where appraisal contingencies and escalation clauses were being starting to be used a lot around here and I just loved when agents I know have been in the business for a long time, like ask me to explain something. I'm like, I would love to educate you today. Let's go. Yeah, yeah, or like, yeah. I would love when I would do um, one thing that I use that I a lot that one offers was I would in Bucks County, not in Philadelphia, because it's a lot. It's more in Philadelphia, but in Bucks County transfer tax on the buyer side, when they're purchasing a home, the transfer tax fee is 1%. So if someone has... $2,500 on a 250 or whatever, an extra $2,500 at closing is like n- sometimes not the end of the world, but it's more net profit for the seller yeah. that they don't have to pay. So it's 1% on the buy side and 1% on the sell side. So we would offer to pay the seller's transfer tax. And that was just like an extra little razzle dazzle. Learning about taxes and different things, and I won't go down a rabbit hole, but it's so crazy. We don't have anything like that in Phoenix. In Philly, it's 2.14 on each side. Like that's a lot. Of, that's an extra chunk. It, you, you're not really going to pay both sides on that in Philly. Interesting. Unless you are like, you know, wealthy. Oh. I mean, the average buyer doesn't have that much extra cash to come to the table with normally. Yeah. And at this day, you know, there's other things to pay for. Um, would you like to give the listeners any financial tips I think for most people, the right place to start with anything related to wealth building is one of two things. Number one is, do you actually know what you're worth? So your net worth is what you own minus what you owe. So let's say you own a house that's worth $400,000, but you owe $300,000 on it. If that was the only thing you own and owe, your net worth would be $100,000. If you don't know the answer to that question, as boring as what I just said sounds, is you need to figure it out. And and you can reach out to me on Instagram, and I'm happy to send, actually, in my LinkedIn bio, I have a net worth tracker in there. You can go in and fill out at Kelly Henderson Realtor. And um, that's where you start. Now, assuming you have debt, like most of America, um, I recommend starting, once you know that number, it's cool, but like, if it could be bigger, you'd probably already be doing that, right? Inherently, I think people just think like, okay, that's where I'm at right now. But like, it's a, it's a lot easier to make change than people give themselves credit for. So, so that goes to part two. Assuming there's some debt, it's about getting in control of your spending habits. And even if there's not debt, you'd still benefit from this exercise. And I always say, print out every statement that has transactions on it. So for me, everything that I do runs through our uh, Southwest credit card for the points. We like the points. So... You, t- you print out whatever statements you need, and on it, you're going to take a highlighter, and you're going to highlight three different colors. Um, you're going to highlight green for everything you need, like actually need. Um, you need power. You need water. You need to pay your mortgage. You need to pay your rent. You need gas, whatever the case is. Those are easy. Then in yellow, you can highlight the things you want. So I might want to eat out. I need to have food. Um, And so I might benefit from going to the grocery store versus eating out at a restaurant, whatever the case is. So we're going to highlight everything we want in yellow. And then in 
pink, you're going to highlight everything that like is 100% unnecessary. So the first time I did this activity, um, which will be news for Dustin to hear, um, the first time I did this activity, I found out we had two Paramount Plus subscriptions just associated with different emails. Like we own both of them. Like, how dumb can you be? But I, had I not slowed down enough to see it, I would have seen yeah. the Paramount charge come through and been like, oh, yeah. And then a couple weeks later, the Paramount charge come through and like, oh, yeah. Like, I would have never caught if I hadn't slowed down enough to say, like, why do we get charged twice in one month for that? Um, so, like, a really easy cost to now the one Paramount charge is a want and then the one is pink for unnecessary and easy to cut. And then you'll find things through that. Just looking at your expenses that you're like, I don't need this. I don't need this. Um, like, that's just so easy to say goodbye to. Now, those pink ones, we can tally them all up now, and that's an immediate change you can make. Let's say it's 100 bucks of stuff that you don't, that you're immediately going to get rid of. Um, also, I had, for me, it was my Audible subscription, 20 bucks a month or whatever it was. I had like 11 books backlogged that I could purchase. Yeah. I'm like, if I quit that today, I wouldn't need a new one for another year. Anyway, I digress. So, um, so let's say, on my chopping list. <laughs> so let's say you have your hundred bucks a month now that you didn't have before. You can apply that to your highest interest rate credit card. Now there's two. Sc- I say that there's really two schools of thought for debt buy down. There's the snowball and the avalanche. Snowball is where you're going to start with your lowest amount and go up to your highest. So let's say you got a Victoria's Secret credit card, so you can get like a discount on your bras one day or whatever, and you owe 100 bucks on that, and you have an Amex with $15,000 on it. You start at the one at the $150 balance, and you work your way up. And it's nice because like getting rid of any sort of debt feels good. So when you can like scratch a credit card off the list, that feels good. That's a mental win. It's not as much of a financial win. The avalanche method says you go highest interest rate down. So your Victoria's Secret credit card might actually be pretty far down the list. Um, But not really, because all credit cards have rapey level of interest rates. And so it's probably going to be credit cards, cars, houses, like kind of in that arena. Um, But when you start with the highest interest rate, then and you're able to pay that off, then you can really like sock that money into the next debt down and the next debt down. So with your hundred bucks you found a month, you're going to go straight to the top. And that's on top of whatever you were already paying. Then you can do the same thing with those things that you highlighted in yellow, your wants. And those yellows that you're getting rid of would be the stuff that's in alignment with your financial goals. So I'm never the kind of person who's going to be like, well, if you made coffee at home and stuff, well, now Dustin's going to be yelling at me now. I'm pretty sure you told me you guys were starting to do that. Okay. No one ever says I became a millionaire because I made my own coffee at home. Right. And so... (laughs) There's times in our life where we need to make adjustments, right? So we can be savvy and smart about something, but it's highly unlikely you're going to become a millionaire from making coffee at home. So you want the wants that you get rid of to be in alignment with your goals. If you're making some short-term adjustments, which is what um, Dustin and I did not too long ago to repad some accounts, but if you're going to make some short adjustments, that's fine. But if you're going to go long-term with something, then that wants list needs to be reflective of the lifestyle you want in connection to your net worth goals. So you can't tell me you want to be a millionaire and then be going out and living this bougie lifestyle. Like those two things aren't in alignment. But if you can make some like choices that make you happy here to be on your way to your goals there, you're never going to like, that's like fad dieting. Yeah. When you want a crash diet and it lasts like a month and then you balloon up right after that. And so same kind of thing financially. So I would, to answer your question, I would track my net worth and then I would realign my expenses so that way I could cut some money to be able to allocate where I wanted it to go. Yeah. That net worth track, net worth tracking class was the first class I took of yours. And it was family reunion, mm, Vegas. So it was online. It was virtual, I think. Yeah. Somewhere in the pandemic time, somewhere. And I was just like, Afterwards, I was like mind blown. I'm like, this is the most valuable like piece of education physically that you get and you can implement immediately, type in and like actually like take this class and get it. So now I'm going to put you on the hot seat. How often do you update your net worth tracker? Not once a month. So I know that you're supposed to be doing it like once a month. The disconnect comes and this is where like a coach is helpful for anyone who's like trying to get in control of their finances is that for the most part, I don't ever teach anybody anything they don't know. Like they might get some good nuggets here and there or something like that. But the bigger issue is the reason most people search out coaching, which is accountability. 
And I I have um, somebody else's credit card in my wallet right now mm-hmm. because they don't I watch them hand it to you. <laughs> they don't want to have the ability to make those purchases. Or when I get on the phone with somebody in a week and they have to tell me that they bought a new puppy, like that was a $3,000 dog, like we're yeah. going to have a chat about it. Um, and so that level of accountability pushes people to this space that like they haven't really been consistently. And that's frankly, like I'm not a miracle worker. That's why people's net worths grow up is because they don't want to hear me bitch about it. Yeah. I just, I, I recall you being like, all right, fork it over. And me, the credit card. Oh, do I have it on me? You're like, you do. (laughs) Actually, I don't have the credit card on me anymore. I had to leave it at home because the other day my daughter was going through my wallet and she pulled it out and she's like, what's this? And I was like, if you can touch this, this is a problem. Like, I need to put this in a place that it needs a heightened level of security. I care more about that credit card than I do my own. Yeah. Well, anyway, that class is badass and I appreciate it. And uh, obviously it led to our friendship, but... um, I remember, recall, it was being streamed and we had it where we couldn't go to the conference, so every room had a different class going on, so they tried to like make it seem like we were at the conference, even though- I totally forgot about that. That makes no sense because we're all together here, so it's like the same thing as being somewhere else. But anyway, um, I was sitting in there and (laughs) I remember, um, I think the children are running around on your end in your house. It had to have been mega camp then. I bet it was mega camp because, I mean, it might have been family reunion, but I remember, ex- oh my gosh, that was horrific. So all I know is you were drinking a Capri Sun while teaching us how to track our network. And I thought that was badass. <laughs> like I was but like, wow, just I the love KWYP this trick. thing. What? It wasn't just KWYP. Oh my gosh. Well, it might've been like a KWYP thing, but it was on, it was when we had those like portals where you would go in and pick a class you wanted to like watch. And it was a live stream. I came in, so... When I started being a coach at the very onset, they did all these kind of interviews and personality assessments. And one of the things that came out of that, so I sat down with this guy and he said, um, yeah, the test came back and was telling me some good things here and there. And finally he goes, yeah, it shows that you're um, inauthentic. And I said, well, that's what, the, impossible. The Keller Williams assessment says that? No, it wasn't. It was a, a different it one. It was a different one. I don't think it says inauthentic in that thing. Well, this one it did. And I was like, that's can't be true and he's like can you give me an example of something that you think would like show your authenticity literally one of the most authentic people I know well you know me post this test so he Uh had said that and I go that's not true I was homeless as a kid I'm openly talk about that I've talked about like financial struggles I've been through business struggles I've been through like I'm pretty quick to throw myself under the like bus if I do something wrong like I'm not really like a fake person And he goes, have you ever walked into a class where like you felt like you needed to dress a certain way to like perceive what you wanted to perceive? And I was like, absolutely. Like when, you know, you want to like look like you're the best in the business or whatever the case is. And he's like, but is that how you dress always? I was like, well, no. And he was like, that's not being your authentic self. And he walked me through a few different examples that whether or not someone agrees with this or not, it did help put a mirror in front of my face where I was like, where am I choosing to be not who I am for that? Mm. And so um, I'm slightly embarrassed, but very proud of Kelly, who apparently was drinking a Capri Sun while teaching this class, because like, that is who I am. I like a good Capri Sun, fruit punch preferably. Same. But like, That took so many years of untraining, like trying to just be whoever I thought people wanted me to be instead of just being me. And it's funny because I'll still deal with it today. I had a listing appointment the other day and I hadn't met them. It was for like a $1.5 million listing. And because I hadn't met them, I felt like I needed to dress like Kelly Henderson, the $1.5 million listing agent. And I was struggling in my closet that day. I ended up taking like 10 different things and being like, thrift store. I can't keep this because this isn't who I am anymore. I don't want to wear this to their appointment. Like I don't like looking like this. And I literally was like, you're not even being, just put on something you like. And it was just, it's such a, it's an, it's a core component to who I am is if I can't be me, then I just don't want to be it. Yeah. And And also like you feel good when you're wearing things that Yeah. And that's such an easy example to use it with clothes. But I was surprised at how often it came up. But like with anything, like I cuss and I like to be in an environment where I feel like I can. Not that I like want to be like raunchy or dirty or anything like that. But I like to feel free to be able to like speak the way I want to speak. Yeah. Or when I teach my classes, they're often like pretty dry and I like to be funny. It's not just like all this content. 
And that's just me. Um, And so anytime I'm outside of that environment, it drains my battery and I do not like it. So hearing what you said does not surprise me, although that would have been very stressful. And I do remember having to move the class into the bathroom because my kids were screaming in the back room. Was that the same one? I think it was separate ones. And I'm pretty sure that Dustin went and like, yeah, I, was like, I got it. I got it. And like wing <laughs> grabbed children. I'm certain he did. But that that is like something that I preach. Like people will work with you because of the way you make them feel and because you're genuine and you're relatable and they trust you because they can relate to you. And like me showing up in a dress and heels all the time or like whatever the case may be, it just not may not connect with a person. Yeah. Like whatever. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't dress your best if you want to. And that's how you want to act. Like, it's not like that's you. That's That's exactly it. If it's you. Yeah. I have a friend who always looks like she just hopped out of like a Nordstrom's magazine. Yeah. She always is on point. Yeah. And (coughs) excuse me. And when I'm with her, I'm always like, I have a moment of being self-conscious about like, I don't look as fabulous as she looks right now or whatever. And then I remember like, she's, I would not enjoy dressing like that every day. No. Um, So it's just about being you and who you want to be. And so hearing you talk about me through that lens is funny because I'm proud of it. And also, yeah, that's what my life looks like. I mean, it worked. I remembered it. It's memorable. I know a lot of people that use their net worth tracker from their monthly better than I do. That's all that matters. Hey, it is what it is. Okay, Instagram again. Your Kelly Instagram. Henderson Realtor. And if you just need something in Arizona, it doesn't need to be sick. We'll figure it out. If it's not Kelly, she'll find you somebody. Um, Absolutely. If you are not following me already, you should be by now. Or if you're new, you can follow me on Instagram at Jewel underscore The Realtor or on TikTok, Jewel The Realtor. Selling Your Circle podcast is everywhere. YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Spotify, Apple Podcast. Uh... I think that's it. I think that's everywhere. Thank you for listening. If you're still here watching or listening, we appreciate you. Give it a little thumbs up, like it, subscribe, follow all the things, and we will see you next time.